Hey, we want to thank you for being with us this morning. And I, I want to just uh, quickly apologize. We had an issue as uh, Dr. Marshall and I were going to go live feed. And uh, so we went ahead, we recorded this, it's being released now. And uh, that's the thing about going live. You never know if it's going to go live. That's but right. hey, I'm alive, you're alive. So <laughs> we're able to do this live. <laughs> that sounds live to me. Amen. But thank you for uh, joining me for this uh, Friday morning devotion. And I'm actually very excited about my guest again. He's not just a guest, he's my friend. And uh, I am um, thankful for uh, some of the ministry we're able to tag into and link arms together with, especially reaching out and counseling and caring, helping people in need and, uh, and, and walking in them through just some very critical moments of their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marshall, that's a part of ministry, isn't it? That's, that's exactly what ministry is for. Ministry yeah. is anything that you do on a consistent basis to bring people to a close relationship with God. And so that is a very important area of ministry, especially right now during the pandemic as we work with the Mental Health Ministry and American Association of Christian Counseling, uh, which also has the vision of Dr. James Dobson focused on the family, uh, working with them, putting together a team of professional certified uh, first responders in the area of mental health is going to be awesome. Only 750 churches were chosen across the United States. And of course, our great church, the Rock Family Worship Center, was one of those anchor churches. And uh, typically, there's the 10, at the most, 15 people that sign up for church they were speaking of. And we went over almost 90 people. And uh, we're just ready and fired up, ready to serve the church yeah. and the community. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you for spearheading that. And you know, you and um, you and Chris said you founded Refresh Church Ministries there in Columbus, Georgia, years ago. Yeah. You oversee churches and pastors all around the world, and uh, and I've I've just it's been refreshing to see how God has connected you with mm -hmm. so many leaders around the world. And um, we had I had no idea the connection of Swaziland. Yeah, uh, until people. we were talking one day, and man, your connection there, and I can't wait to go with you and, Praise God. and be with you there because we support Children's Cup, a part yeah. of that. That's yeah. a great, great country, great nation. You swan eating now, they changed the name to Swaziland. I still call it Swaziland, it's like a second home to me. We worked with the um, with the church there, a great church there, Jesus Called Worship Center, with uh, Dr. Uh, Casaro and uh, the Royal Family, His Majesty. We work with them in ministry as well as met them at the United Nations in New York. Uh, every September, we try to support them and encourage them. And it's just been a great relationship overseas, working not only with that country, but many more as we uh, try to just facilitate God's will in the earth. Well, that's, I mean, that's just exciting. I, and I love, I love that connection. And I'm very thankful about uh, pastoral counseling and how you're helping us with that now and just so grateful. But today, I want to I wanna discuss something I opened up on Tuesday because we've, I've been going through release principles, um, okay. responsibility, excellence, leadership, encounter. And the A for release, it's an acrostic. It, it uh, represents authority, yeah. spiritual authority, not only from the understanding of submitting ourselves under authority so we can operate in authority. It's a, it's a powerful principle of the kingdom. But I, I want to talk about spiritual warfare today and authority we have. All I want to do is lay out a passage of scripture, and then I want to give a quote by Francis Frangipan, and I want to just serve up a softball and just say, here, knock this out of the park, because I know... Well, you we'll, bunt or <laughs> bunt. We might bunt. we'll get on base, man. You got to bunt. We'll get on base. All right. Somebody else <laughs> said, oh. But here's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10. He said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Look at the, the mind that is involved here. 
Yes, we destroy arguments, arguments, every lofty thing, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when our obedience is complete. Francis Frangipan, who I love this man of God. I've read books by him through the years. Just an incredible man. But here's, here's a quote from him. He said, you will remember that the location where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha, which meant the place of the skull. If we will be effective in spiritual warfare, the first field of conflict where we must learn warfare is the battleground of the mind, the place of the skull. So the territory of the uncrucified thought life is the beachhead of satanic assault in our lives. And to defeat the devil, we must be crucified in the place of the skull. We must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Praise God. That's that, is a, that is just a powerful statement. And powerful. because the battle begins here, we even refer to today the struggle of mental health. Mm -hmm. I know some of those things are chemical. I realize that. Yeah. But the spiritual conflict, talk to us about that today. And let's just tie in authority of what God has given us in his kingdom. Praise God. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Pastor Rusty, for having me on with you in the morning devotion. I really appreciate it. I'm so honored. Thank God for you and Pastor Lisa. Uh, I just, you know, I praise you guys everywhere, the work that you're doing, not only in the church, outside the church, how you love us, Teresa and I, and everybody, but the leadership you've shown, we get ready to go into a little bit about leadership, the leadership that you all have shown during the pandemic has been absolutely uh, magnificent. And so I want to, first of all, before we get into the word, just thank God for you and uh, you guys' uh, hard work and service and leadership during this pandemic. You know, um, I listened to the quotes that you read and the scriptures and the quotes, and they, they are absolutely correct. Everything that we go through as believers is going to start in our mind regarding warfare. It's not going to start anywhere else. It's going to start right between our ears. You know, the Bible says in Romans 12 and uh, 1 through 2, he, he gives us a hint here. Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and subject to God. But he tells us how to do this in this passage of scripture uh, one and two. He says, do not be conformed to this world, which means don't have the ideology. Don't think like the world or like you used to. He said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which of course we spoke uh, earlier. It's a metamorphosis. It's like a tadpole turning into a frog or a butterfly turning into a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. When you, are, when you are a caterpillar, you're limited. You have to crawl. You go from limb to limb, branch to branch. But when you come out of that stage of, of where your mind is, is, is maturing, you become that butterfly, you, you can fly away from the prey that would normally eat you and destroy you. And so I believe that as a metaphor, God wants us to mature from that caterpillar stage in our mind when we give our life to him and move farther into that place of that butterfly where, we, where there's no, no limits and we have the ability to fly and get away from the enemy and certain things of our lives. But I also believe when we talk about the warfare in our mind, and I look through the Bible and um, I, I am, I'm amazed at the revelation or the allegories that God allows us to see in his word. And the greatest, most profound battle that has ever happened in the Bible outside of the crucifixion on the cross uh, uh, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we call the wine press. And the Bible says this, and through, um, through theologies, through, uh, uh, we, we learn through, 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 through teachings and, and scripture, matter of fact, that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was in the process of going to courtroom. And we'll talk about that later. He was in the process of going to the courtroom. He was in the process of going to Golgotha, the skull. But prior to getting there, the Bible says he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And as he began to pray, it said sweat fell off of his face like drops of blood. That right there is profound for me. And, and I want to read this scripture here just, just for a second here. It, it's, it's just amazing. It's Luke chapter 22, 
verse 44. It says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so what we see here is his mind. He's giving us a type and shadow of where the warfare starts. It starts in the mind. He is so intensified. The warfare is so profound. Uh, he's carrying the sins of all mankind that was um, dead, that was alive and would be born on his shoulders. He's feeling that. He's feeling the stress and pressure that we feel. And the battle in his mind was so profound, Pastor, that he began to sweat drops of blood. It means that veins began to burst in his forehead and began to burst blood red rose down his face. Uh, then he goes to the cross, I fast forward, he goes to the cross, they try to mock him and humiliate him. <laughs> this, this is powerful. They take the thorns of crowns, crowns of thorn, and they put on his head. And they put those thorns on his head, mocking him as saying that he was the Yeshua of the king. But in actuality, he allowed that to occur because he realized that that was where the battle was going to be. And he was letting us know that I won this battle in my mind, that I am king of the battle of the mind. And if I overcome the world, you can overcome the world. So we yeah. see two instances where, one, he, he defeats the enemy of our mind in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating blood, but he didn't stop there. He says, not my will, but thy will be done. And he gets up and he finishes his assignment. And that's what we have to do if we're gonna, we're gonna go for it. We have to get up from that place that's agony, that we're stressed, that we are, uh, are, are being uh, uh, just attacked in our mind. We have to keep on moving. We get to that place called Gagatha and they mock him. And we can think about it and say, you know what? Jesus wore those crowns on his head. <laughs> Glory to God, so that I could get victory over every mental attack, every mind attack that I would have. But when I think about the authority that God gives us, you know, if we look in the book of, 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 of Matthew chapter 28 there, a very familiar scripture, and we sometimes we call that the Great Commission, where he's sending people out. But really, that is not only the Great Commission, but it's the Great Transfer. <laughs> Man, so <laughs> what happens is that he says this, and he says, then, it's just, just, a, just real quick verse here, he says here in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, and I, I just, you know how technology is this morning, it's working real good for us, <laughs> but it, it's working real good for us, so he says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And so now we find out that the communication is happening in the mountain, in a high place. When God speaks to us, he wants to speak to us in a place where we can see what's happening. And I'm just going to deviate just a little bit, not chase the rabbit, but look for just a, just a confirmation scripture here. The Bible says that Paul said, I knew a man about 14 years ago in the body, out of bodies I couldn't tell, but he was taken up to the third heaven and he was shown things that a human being normally cannot see and, and uh, things that they're only supposed to talk about. But he says, he took me to the third heaven, which lets us know that there are three heavens, the heaven that we have on earth, and there's a second heaven where the prince of air rules. And then there's a third heaven where Jehovah God, the king of kings live. And he takes Paul up into the third heaven and he looks and he says, look down here in the first heaven. What do you see? And he saw his life. He saw the humanity. And he says, look at the second heaven. And he sees Satan ruling over, over this world and, and being the prince of the air. And then he says, now look where you're seated at, in heaven and places. He says, now you get back down there because my grace is sufficient. As long as you are connected to the third heaven from the first heaven, the second heaven doesn't have power over you, glory to God. And so you have the ability to be win over the battle or the warfare in your mind if you stay connected to the third heaven. I've got a lamp over here and it's plugged into the wall. So I'm, in, I'm connected to all the power in Alabama because I'm plugged in the wall. But when I unplug that lamp, I don't have the same power. The light bulb goes off and everything. So we have to stay plugged into that third heaven to give us power over that second heaven. But he tells them in this mountain, this high place, he says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority 
and heaven and earth has been given to me. Not some authority, but he says all authority in heaven and in earth, the entire universe. He says, I possess all authority. It gets better. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So he tells them, I'm going to be with you through this assignment, a process of development in your life as you serve me. But he says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. So we find that there was a transfer because he didn't have that power in the beginning. Not in the sense that he didn't have it as the son of God, but I'm speaking of the fact we as humanity didn't have it. That's a transfer scripture. The Bible says Adam and Eve lost the power in the garden. They had authority and dominion over everything. I mean, one day the weather's perfect. Uh, it's a utopia. They're petting the tigers, the lions, the bears. Uh, they're naming everything. It's going great. And all of a sudden they sin and they're disconnected from God. And when they get disconnected from God, the temperature changed in, in, the, in, the, in the world, in that garden. The, everything changed. Animals became angry and bitter. And, and now the whole humanity changed. Man, so by one man's disobedience, we lost the original authority and the original power that God gave us. And we lost it to Satan. So Satan now is ruling the world, not God's original intent. God's original intent was for man to have dominion, for man to have authority, and for man to live forever. But after man had sinned, they got disconnected. And so God had to put a plan together. This is where it really gets good, because now man is guilty, and the accuser, the devil, and, and now uh, we, 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 we've got a judge who is God, but we don't have anybody to defend man. <laughs> So Jesus not only comes in the courtroom and defends man, he becomes man. <laughs> and, so, and so as he walks through this thing, he, he goes through this and says, well, you lost all authority, you lost all power, and you lost all dominion. And now I own this world. That's Satan speaking. Then we trans transition after Malachi to Matthew. After years of silence, God is not speaking, and all of a sudden God speaks, and he, he brings in Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew 1 and 21. But it goes into verse chapter 4 of Matthew, and I'll go real quick, Matthew chapter 4, and Satan attempts Jesus. Jesus is baptized, uh, the, the anointing of God, the dove descends upon him, is confirmed that he is the son of God before the prophet John. He, he goes up to be tempted after 40 days. When he gets there, when he gets to be tempted, Satan says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. He said, if you are the son of God. He says, man should not live by bread alone. He says, okay, okay. He says, oh, wait, why don't you jump off of here? He says, because the scripture says the angels have charge over thee. You know, jump off here and see what happens. Jesus says, you shouldn't tempt the Lord thy God. So he kept fighting him with word. And then he says, I tell you what, come on, come with me. And he takes him to a high place in a moment's time. And he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you bow down to me, I will give you everything you see in this earth. I'll give you the second heaven and the first heaven. I'll give you all this. The audacity of Satan to tempt someone that created all of the heavens and all of the things that he's offered. Him. That's like me saying, hey, Pastor Rusty, uh, how about uh, uh, I sell you your truck? It's like, man, this is my truck. How are you going to sell me my truck? <laughs> and so he says, he says, he says, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of this. Jesus says, no, the scripture says you should only worship the Lord thy God. And so what happens is Jesus says, but I'm going to take you up on that. He says, since you've got all power, he says, I'm going to take you up on getting that power from you, but I'm going to use another process. <laughs> And his process was through the death, burial, and resurrection, and he gave us that power back. And as he gave us that power and authority back, he wants us to walk in it. But the problem that we face in walking in authority and power is that we don't understand the spiritual warfare. That means the enemy does not want us to walk in that authority and power. So what he does is he attacks our mind. We can go to church, any church in America, 
any denomination you want to go to. And you can say, let's give God some glory and praise. And people lift their hands and they'll say, hallelujah, glory to God, shabbat, whatever. Toyota, <laughs> Honda, whatever they want to do. And, and they'll just praise, they'll praise God. You know, it's kind of half lobster, but, you know, then you push them a little bit and, and exhort them. They'll get it fired up some more. But then when you mention in any church, let's bind the devil. Oh, my God. In the name of Jesus, people just go radical when we talk about binding the devil up. But when we talk about praising God, it's not as so 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 ex exciting and uh, exuberant. And the reason is because people don't realize that the enemy don't have that power no more, that authority. And so we're fighting a guy that's defeated because we don't understand our rights in the kingdom of God. You know, the Bible says that authority in the Greek literally means, I love this, it means property or wealth. It means precious and weighty. It means the ability to, watch this, to perform an act legally. And so the Greek says authority means we have the right to perform an act legally. See, you can perform an act, but it doesn't mean it's legal. And so now he gives us the legal right to walk in authority and dominion. Authority means it's possible that not only we have the ability, but now we have the right to do it because of what Jesus did. I, I love this, what this says. And so as a people of God, we have to understand that if we're going to win in our walk with God, we are going to have to win the battle right here. And the way we do it, and I'll go quick, is we have to submit to God. There's three weapons we can use against the enemy. We can use the word of God. The word of God. It is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We can use the blood of Jesus oh, that covers a multitude of sins and causes things to pass over our doorposts. Amen. And we can use the name of Jesus, <laughs> but there's no name greater than the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he's Lord. So he gives us some tools to be able to fight against the enemy when he comes against us because he had a transfer, the authority transferred back to him. And that's when he says, all authority has been given to me. It transferred back and then he gives it to us and then he tells us, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I'm driving down my street, pastor. There's a little lady, she's probably, uh, she's about 60, late 60s, about 90 some pounds. And, and she's just, you know, just sitting out there. She's got this sign that says, stop. Okay, and here's this big old truck coming, you know, uh, a truck coming down. It's a school zone, and she puts that thing out there, and she's only about 80, 90 pounds, and she's about 60 some years old, but she sticks that sign up, and that big two-ton truck with that big burly driver in it, he has to uh, stop, put the brakes on, and he has to obey the authority that's in front of him, and that's obey us because if he runs the light, if he goes to the school zone, then a higher authority will arrest him. <laughs> Glory to God. When the enemy don't want to act like he's listening to you, there's a higher authority that says, uh-uh, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose heaven. We have the authority and power back that God gave us that Adam lost, and what we have to do is begin to acknowledge it and walk in it. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, Amen. Sheila, sit and think about that for a minute. Just, <laughs> just, you know, that's why James said, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Yes. Resist the devil. Say, stop. Yes. That's right. Stop. It's, there's power in your mouth. There's power mm. in your confession. Confess yes, with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Confess that. You, yes. That's how salvation happens. And when we resist the devil, it means open your mouth. Yes. Declare, not on my watch. Amen. Not in my mind. Amen. Four, it says, give no place to the devil. No ground, because he's not satisfied with your little bitty log cabin in the corner. Mm -hmm. He wants everything. He wants it all. And he wants your devotion. He wants, he, he wants your dedication, everything yeah. that comes with that. But he wants your fear. 
Yeah. And he functions, operates in fear, and the torment of the mind with oppression, obsession, and even those that have possession. Yeah. God wants to bring you freedom and liberty. And brother, the, the illustrations you've given today, just the lacing together from Genesis to now has been uh, encouraging. It's been amazing. So thank you. <laughs> That's thank you. Thank you. This, this devotional time, I pray you've opened your heart, your mind, allow Holy Spirit to show you the authority Jesus purchased for us. Amen. Those three weapons, those three tools that he's given us his word, that the marshal said, given us his blood and his name. He ties it in with the word of your testimony. Open your mouth. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Yes, sir. Who he yes, is, sir. Bishop? Will you pray over us? Pray I sure will. I sure, I sure will, Pastor. And, and and when we talk about prayer, we talk about the armor of God that you spoke on earlier. We talk about the six areas. We talk about the belt, the breastplate, the footwear, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. But if you keep reading verse eighteen, it says prayer. And I believe that there's. I believe there's one more that we always leave out. And that's prayer. We've yes. got to pray. And I believe we've got to understand the power of our words. You can change your life by the power of your words. And so my prayer today is that God would change you and give you the yes. tongue of the learned. Yes. Because the centurion said, I've got a sick servant, but you don't have to go to my house. Just speak the word and he shall be healed. Job yes. said, I decree a thing and God establish it. I pray that God will begin to work on your inner man that you'll begin to speak differently. Because when you begin to speak differently, you're habitually changing the way you think as well. And so you speak the word of God, which is more powerful than anything. It will change everything in your life. I pray that God will give you the peace to surpass all understanding. That God will give you joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And I bind up every warfare against your mind. And I say no more to it in Jesus' name. And I release today, over your mind and over your spirit with my great pastor and friend, Rusty Nelson, that you will walk in victory because thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are free and who he sets free is free indeed. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you, Bishop. Thank you for being with us. And thank you. Thank you for joining us today for this Friday devotion. I pray that uh, even with all the technical difficulties we had in the beginning and probably some through this, it's a very stormy, it's been a stormy day here. I don't know if that's, I'm not a technician, but I do. I, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express one time, but just be blessed. We love you today. And uh, next Tuesday morning, I, I pray you can join me for my Tuesday devotion. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.